I found my way to the exchange actually through my brother, Bob, who was uh, a clerk in the S&P Futures crowd at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And I had just graduated from the University of Michigan. I um, had planned to go to law school. I was an English major. And uh, so I decided to take a year off and I needed to find a place to work in that year. And my brother just said, come down to the floor and I can get you a job. So that's what I did. My first job was at a runner for Prudential. Um, I worked for Mike Bechtel and I was up in the currencies. Every once in a while I get an order to take to the Euro crowd which obviously uh, was a pretty unbelievable experience back then considering we're talking about probably, I don't know, 5,000 people in that room. Uh, which was the size of a football field. At the CME in that business, as in any business, it just seems like um, if you show some aptitude and some interest, you'll just start to naturally move your way up the ladder. And so I was running and wanted to make a little bit more money. So my brother was a clerk in the S&P Futures and uh, there was a firm there called Timber Hill and they traded primarily electronically. They were one of the first electronic trading firms. And to become uh, a clerk with Timber Hill, you needed to path, pass a math test. So I was pretty good in math. I was comfortable taking the test. And so my brother introduced me to that group and they sat me down. I took the test. I think I got, uh, I think I got one wrong. So like a 95%, but it was good enough. So then I got hooked on with Timber Hill. And I was a clerk in the S&P Futures crowd, uh, the Maxis, and in the S&P options. In the Timber Hill operation, you know, they're primarily options-based, and most of their activity was at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. There wasn't, a, you know, a huge future. There wasn't a the chance for me to get on a seat at the CME, whereas they said, well, if you go over to the CBOE, there's a chance you can get on a seat and start trading. And, uh, you know, being a kid, I, I didn't really necessarily know what that meant other than the fact that, you know, you see all these other guys doing it and think, uh, well, I'll give it a shot. That's how I ended up at the CBOE and that's how I ended up uh, getting put on a seat in trading. The way they put people into the business, put them on a seat basically, was they had an individual trading in pretty much every equity crowd and you traded on a a computer that was wired into the phone system and every time you entered a trade you placed it into the computer it got shot to Valhalla New York where their home office was and then they would hedge it so basically all we had to do in the crowd was trade trade and punch it into your computer and all the prices were there so as long as you were trading within the parameters of the prices that you were given you were good to go and uh, you know as you can imagine being a person that's basically just pushing buttons and entering trades in a trading crowd with other people who are trading their own money, they've got their own cash on the line and you're just basically a hired gun looking to pound out as many trades as you can, you got a little flack. You know, naturally people used to you know, say, uh, I guess you took a step up from working at McDonald's. It was something that you had to deal with, but anytime you're in a trading crowd on the floor, <laughs> you always had some kind of kind of something to deal with. Eventually when we went to a computer-based trading system where you're entering your quotes electronically and they're getting thrown in with other electronic quotes with people off the floor, we needed a, a good-sized laptop to do that and it was a touch screen you know back in the day 19 pro or probably around 2001 or 2002. You had this computer and you know nowadays the computers are a little bit lighter, the little a little bit more efficient but this is a you know probably a 15 pound piece of machinery that we used to hang around our necks and so it would just be kind of dragging on you all day and you wouldn't really notice it you know after a while 
I got a little bit of an issue in my back from having my computer around my neck all the time. Um, I don't think that I got any kind of PTSD from being on the floor, but there's a certain amount of, I don't know what it is, it's just the excitement, the adrenaline, being down there. Uh, and I've talked about this with other people who used to be on the floor, that you have trading dreams. And sometimes those are, I, they're typically not good dreams. It's typically not like you had the perfect position on and you made a million dollars and retired. Uh, it's typically you're stuck in a position and it's going against you and then your computer dies and you can't get out and then you wake up in a cold sweat. My family was impacted uh, from trading on the floor. You know, I was on the floor roughly uh, eight years and there are a lot of ups and downs in the business and it's, it's something that being at younger at the time, um, I didn't really take into account as much as I wish I had. Um, but I think that financially there are a lot of ebbs and flows with being a floor trader and being a trader in general. And so that can take its toll. I mean, that's one of the main reasons why I'm not a trader anymore. I'm still in the business on the compliance side. But, you know, as things got hard on the floor, it got difficult to make a buck and uh, had to move into another area of the business. Christmas time on the floor was a really fun time, exciting time, a lot of Christmas parties. Working with the people on the floor, the clerks and the other people that help you throughout the year. If you've had a good year, it's the time where you can give back a little bit. So you, you know, give out a $50 handshake there and you know, give some money to your uh, desk broker, that kind of thing, or the, the crowd broker. We had uh, a guy in the S&P options, the uh, SPX crowd, uh, and he was a Timber Hill guy, Al. And uh, he used to, for whatever reason, he had uh, the Grinch that stole Christmas memorized. And every year, at some point during the holidays, he would perform The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. I don't know if it's a bad memory necessarily. As it worked out, it wasn't a terrible uh, situation, but I remember it being very hectic. I used to trade ExxonMobil, and they, uh, the Exxon Valdez ruling came out, and we didn't even know necessarily. Back then, you didn't have the news immediately like you do now. We had a ticker that would give us news events, but you know, now you get notified on your phone. The news just travels much faster. And so orders started to hit our crowd, and we started to get what we call raised trades, retail automated execution system. And we were getting raised trades, and we didn't know why. And um, then all of a sudden, I've got 10 raised trades. I've got brokers coming into the trap in the crowd, trying to you know trade, hitting different markets. And at this time, I wasn't using. I went, we had uh, electronic. Uh, order tickets eventually that would keep track of our positions and the raise trades would go in there automatically and then eventually when we had the computers our raise trades would go in automatically but this was before that so all I had was a handful of raise trades I'm making trades with uh, floating brokers coming into the crowd and after about 15 minutes I literally did not know what my position was I didn't know uh, where my Greeks were I didn't know how many deltas I had or what I had to do to hedge them I actually had to run out of the crowd, get to a computer where I could pull up my position, put in all my raise trades, put in all my broker trades, figure out what my deltas were, and then run to hedge them. So uh, I remember that it, you know I was only off, I was, it's not insignificant, but probably around 2,000 deltas to cover, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I lost money on it. You can't really quantify it. Um, there are people that went down on the floor and made millions. Certainly, uh, if you were disciplined and you did your homework, you can certainly walk away making millions of dollars. You could be, you know, you could limit your risk. You can make a good living down there. Um, from what I was doing, being a market maker at the CBOE. Um, the order flow was important. So if you didn't have order flow, if you didn't have people coming and, and trading your markets, then it, it wasn't uh, the place to be. And at the end of the day, that's one of the reasons that I left. So if you got the order flow, then you'll make a good living. 
My best day on the floor, I can't really say I had one specific day that was the best. Going into Y2K, we had some serious uh, volatility. Well, the volatility was getting cranked up and all the front month options were getting really expensive. And that was a tough position to be in. It's really hard to be long options when everyone's buying them. So eventually you're gonna get short and just the question of when and then can you withstand the move as volatility keeps going up. Um, and I was trading a stock called Infospace and that was one of the, uh, this, this just to put, uh, put it into perspective, this stock started out being a $10, $20 stock and um, it, have ended, it ended up being uh, like a $280 stock. It had uh, the, the potential to move and, and to double in one day, as a lot of the tech stocks did back then. And um, we were trading Infospace, and the, you know, the volatility was getting ramped up. At one point, the front month at the money straddle was, I think, $60. So basically, um, if you sold it, if the stock didn't move $60 from that point, you made money on the trade. So that'll give you an idea of just how the volatility was ramped up. And we also had with relief at that time, which um, you know, gave us a little bit more edge in those markets because they were thinly traded and everyone in the crowd was um, short volatility and feeling the pain. So um, yeah, that time it was difficult and it was stressful, but you know, when you weather that storm, and realize that you're not going to have a $60 move in one day and you can stay on top of your position and trade discipline, when we got through that, it ended up being a very good thing for, for everyone trading that. Well, the most dramatic event, I'm sure a lot of people went through something similar, was 9-11. Um, uh, the 9-11 event, I don't know if it was a strategy necessarily, but I found myself um, long pretty often long gamma and I typically traded from the long side whereas a lot of people trade from the you know short side premium sellers and I was long gamma in 2001 and you know I thought that there were going to there was going to be good volatility coming out of 2000 when we had Y2K and volatility got cranked up but um, volatility was coming off and then 9-11 um, happened and oddly enough uh, I was not on the trading floor when 9-11 happened. Um, I was, it was my son's first day in preschool, and I had taken the day to take my son to preschool. I get up in the morning, as I always do, and I turn on the TV, CNBC, and and we all know what happened on 9-11. Um, you know, the a plane had hit the World Trade Center, and at that time it was just Tower One and they didn't they thought that it was an accident. So then, you know, Tower Two happens and we realize that the country's under attack. I ran upstairs and said to my wife, I have to go down to the trading floor. Uh, I've got positions on. This is gonna be the craziest day ever. And uh, she said, You're absolutely not going to the trading floor. This country's under attack. Who knows? what's next and I said you know this was a point of contention I said I have to go and I'm gonna figure out how, how I can get downtown as soon as possible so I called uh, the my stock desk on the floor because I needed to put in some stock orders and they said it's looking like they're gonna close the trading floor and um, I think everyone's going home and that's how it you know it turned out that everyone was sent home but um, yeah, I'll never forget that. I was a volatility bull, I would say, back in the day. Typically, I was long volatility and trying to scout my gamma and pay for it. I didn't really care where the stocks went. I just wanted them to move. They could go up or down. I can only think of a handful of times, one of them being an info, info space where I was uh, short any kind of you know, significant gamma. The nice thing about Timber Hill is that they put you on the floor, they give you a computer, and you really didn't need to know 
exactly what you were doing. As long as you could execute trades, put them into the computer, they'd go to New York, they'd be hedged. So I actually learned how to trade kind of backwards. I learned how to execute trades, how to get in on trades. I learned what the uh, protocol was on the trading floor as far as executing trades. And then out of that, I started to pick up more and more about exactly what I was doing, exactly what the Greeks were, and how to trade and hedge and manage your position um, outside of being able to execute on the trading floor. I can't think of a specific error that was painful. I do remember um, an error that occurred when um, this was in the time of the designated primary market maker, the DPM, so that there was some kind of computer glitch with our DPM, and for whatever reason, they hit a bunch of my bids that were way away from the market. So it basically, if I had just turned around and hedged it, it would have been like a $30,000 winner. And But I knew that it was an error, and they're the DPM, and I didn't you know, want to stuff them with a bunch of trades that were obviously erroneous. And that wouldn't put me in a good position in the future, obviously, because they wouldn't really uh, like me too much if I had stuck them with that. So, so I went to the DPM and I said, hey, I think these are errors. Can you tell me if they're errors? Because otherwise I need to hedge them. They said, we're definitely having problems. It's definitely an error. We'll figure it out. I said, okay, great. So, uh, you know, eventually, you know, we just... Uh, I just decayed the trades and we just uh, busted them. Typically, we would uh, chat, talk about sports, talk about you know the markets or you know news events, and uh, eventually, every crowd on the floor got a TV. And uh, this was due to uh, a commentator at CNBC, uh, Dorfman, and they used to call it being dwarfed because he would make options recommendations, and he would pick a specific option and you know if it was your crowd you'd get a lot of orders for that specific option because this guy's on TV telling people to buy or sell an option so um, for people to be prepared for that you had to be able to watch CNBC and watch Dorfman to see if he was going to dwarf your crowd and um, so we would watch Dorfman definitely but we you know we would also put on um, Jerry Springer or uh, sports whatever we could tune in. Eventually we had full cable access so uh, during the holidays we'd put on uh, the bowl games and stuff like that and there might have been some wagering going on as well. I wouldn't say that I necessarily worked the brokers. My attitude when I was on the trading floor was to conduct myself as ethically as I possibly could and I always try to take the high road on everything and especially my relationships with the brokers if they came to me in good faith and their customer had an error and you know they traded too many then you know typically I would cut back and um, you know bust whatever they needed busted in order you know to make their customer right um, and I just think that I got the reputation of being an honest person an ethical person and I, I think people respected that. I think that was the important thing with the brokers on the floor. You wanted them to respect you and to look at you as being an honest person. I think of the process of breaking into a trading crowd. I guess at some point, you know, that someone's really trying to break into a crowd, and if they're just getting flack from the other locals, they're getting flack from potentially. Um, the crowd broker, eventually, if they stick it out long enough, they'll get a bone thrown to them by somebody. Uh, it could be a floating broker, um, it could be someone else in the crowd, and that's the little piece of hope that you get that maybe you can stick it out and actually break into the crowd. And I guess it's those moments that I think of when, you know, somebody threw a, a guy that's, you know, just trying to break in and trying to do his best, somebody threw him a bone. 
I think the most important life lesson to take away from being on the trading floor is that there are things that you don't think you can do uh, and you absolutely can. When I first got to the trading floor, I was scared. Uh, I was in you know situations where I was trying to break into a trading crowd and I was getting a lot of flack and I really did not think that trading was the right thing for me. I didn't think I was in the right place and I didn't have anywhere else to go necessarily and so I stuck it out and uh, you know y you take your lumps and you learn and eventually you'll surprise yourself and realize that you can make it and you can put up with a lot and still come out on the other side. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my brother Bob because uh, you know he's the one who got me into the business and I did look up to him and he was a good guide as far as suggesting that I go and work for Timber Hill and you know it, that it was a good kind of stepping stone to other things. Um, you know, Paul and Rich Coplin and Rich Lund, they were uh, the members of my trading group, the founders, and they were the ones that took me from Timber Hill, saw something in me when I was at Timber Hill, and you know, decided that I would make a good market maker and someone who could handle that on my own. And they certainly helped me through that process. When I started in the business, um, there was, I don't want to say a gentleman's agreement. I don't know how this is necessarily considered. I don't know if history looks favorably upon this, but every exchange had the classes that were singly listed on that exchange. So we had ExxonMobil, we had Burlington Northern, um, we had Jones Apparel in our crowd, um, and then CBOE had IBM and Philip Morris and or was it, I don't know if it was Philip Morris, but IBM and um, you know a few other classes that were only traded at CBOE, and then the Amex had their classes and the Philex had their classes. I think that that worked out great for all of the market makers on those exchanges that traded those singly listed classes because if someone wanted to trade listed options they had to come to you. They had to trade your markets. You saw all of that order flow and that you know that was the recipe for success back then just trade and hedge. And then at the ISC came along in 2000 um, the listing war I don't know if you want to call it a war but it was more of just a a poof and everybody listed everyone else's classes and it had to happen that that's just the way that business was going and I don't know why it was listed options that seemed to go electronic before anything else or that had such a um, an impact on the trading because as far as equity options it seemed like um, that the electronic market just really put the floor people out of business. I would have bought a seat in 2000 um, that, uh, that you know at that time seat, the seat price was uh, I think it was around for a full membership at the Chicago Board of Trade which I could have used as an exerciser at the CBOE I think it was around a hundred or hundred fifty thousand and I had had a good year in 2000 with a lot of you know, volatility and Y2K and that kind of thing. So I had the money to buy a seat, um, but everyone on the floor thought that the floor was going to be a bowling alley someday and you know that, that eventually it was going to go all electronic. And I was too young to really understand that a seat represented ownership in the exchange and that was something that wasn't going away and that obviously today has proved to be worth millions. Right after Y2K, there was good volatility. The year 2000 was a good year, but what was introduced to the business at that time was the International Securities Exchange, and they were an electronic you know, exchange that um, they weren't going to be floor-based, it was going to be all electronic, and they were going to compete with the CBOE, PhilEx, Amex, etc. So the ISC came along and they listed all of our contracts and so now we've got competition and that you know 
caused the order flow to kind of fragment and we weren't getting as much order flow as we previously had. And then um, we had 9-11 in 2001 and that created a little bit of volatility, but I expected there to be more volatility. And what happened, you know, combined the fragmentation of the market and then just volatility collapsing in 2001 until, I don't know when it really picked back up again, 2006 maybe. It, it just was really hard to make a dollar down there unless you, uh, unless you're a really serious premium seller and you were willing to take that risk, which I wasn't and the group I was with wasn't. So I needed to, you know, find a steady paycheck. I had a family, so I had, you know, mouths to feed and had to move on to something else. 2004, I, uh, I decided that it was time. I needed to move on to something else. And uh, oddly enough, the NASD, the National Association of Securities Dealers, which is now known as FINRA, a regulator, uh, was looking for someone with derivatives experience. They had a derivatives team, and they were doing contract work for, uh, oddly enough, the International Securities Exchange. So basically, uh, you know, the exchange that put a lot of floor guys out of business, I went and was doing contract work for them through the NASD, helping them regulate their markets. Doing market regulation for a few years, uh, the natural move from there is into compliance. A lot of firms view having experience as a, at a regulator as uh, valuable, and it is quite valuable. Um, and then my floor trading experience, and so I got into compliance, and that's where I am today, Chief Compliance Officer at Straits Financial.